I should warn you that the review that follows contains spoilers for She-Hulk Episode 3 so bear, okay. There doesn't seem to be much of a need for Jennifer Walters to break the fourth wall in the first few episodes, then. Even though it's a crucial component of the comic, the program hasn't used it or performed it as well as it could have. Up until episode 3, that is. In the most recent episode, there is a pleasant improvement in how both the character and the writers appear to be a little more at ease with, not only themselves, but also the audience they are writing for. How do I know this? Well, our lord and savior Wong makes an appearance in this episode, and in her fourth wall breaks, Jennifer makes several references to the fact that us Marvel fans love Wong and want to see him, but also assures us in pre-anticipation of our criticism that She-Hulk is not gonna be one of those cameo every week kinda shows. This kind of fourth wall breaking is clever and adds genuine dimension to the series, even though I don't think this specific comment is necessarily true, after all, we know Daredevil is scheduled to make an appearance because it shows that the writer's room isn't in some remote bubble, blissfully unaware of what fans want, they're all too aware of the discourse surrounding the show and the ways that some fans think, so the fourth wall break is a really interesting way to help. I think you will see this whole thing in a totally different light after hearing from him. The fact that Wong doesn't merely come in this episode for fanservice is a plus. It's actually a crucial element to the series since it skillfully ties together Abomination's appearance in Shanghai and the results of that, tying everything up in a cute little bow. It felt like a throwaway Easter egg by Feige. It felt like a throwaway Easter egg by Feige to placate Marvel fans with their favorite action figures when Abomination and Wong made a brief appearance in Shanghai. That might have been the intention at the time, but continuing to reference that event in She-Hulk is some of the most effective world building and cross-linking scene in Phase 4 so far, because up until now, a lot of the Phase 4 series and movies felt a little too self-contained, with Marvel throwing in all these origin stories with the hopes that it all makes sense by Phase 5. So, seeing some continuity outside of Wanda, Doctor Strange, and Spider-Man was a welcome addition to the episode, even if Abomination's story itself seems pretty inconsequential. The writers also sprinkled in a blink-and-you-miss-it reference to the Shadow Realm, which we know is the home of Clea's introduced in the Doctor Strange 2 post credit scene. These little references all bode well for Phase 5 and 6, and as Kronk would say, oh yeah, it's all coming together. My main criticism is that, from the trailers, Abomination's role in She-Hulk seems a lot bigger than it actually is, but I doubt we will see much of him in the second half of the series, as his story arc seems to be resolved quite nicely by the end of the episode. Oh, wait. Abomination was definitely a one-dimensional villain in The Incredible Hulk, but through comedy, Tim Roth is able to flesh out the character with genuinely funny eccentricity, providing Russell Brand-like lightness and comic relief. Abomination's addition to the series is a good one, with the bulk of his jokes actually landing, but nobody likes feeling a little misled by trailers. It cheapens the experience. However, one moment in Episode 3 that was kept a secret until earlier this week was the surprise cameo of Megan the Stallion. Megan's cameo is brief, but is definitely a standout moment that proves the MCU is just as culturally relevant as ever. This is the first episode to introduce a B-plot, so it's a lot to get your head around and is definitely a change of pace, but after two episodes of Dennis making sexist jibes at Jen, watching him get his commupance and be humbled at last is definitely a moment fans will enjoy. Unfortunately, the CGI hasn't gotten any better, Abomination's modeling being reused from Shanghai only serves to amplify how amateurish She-Hulk's CGI looks, but this episode definitely marks a positive turning point for the series, as it continues to address sexist microaggressions and consider themes like misogyny, women's safety, and cancel culture in a more mature and nuanced way, while also strengthening its ties to the MCU as a whole and developing its own, distinct tone. Nonetheless, the future looks bright and green for She-Hulk.